This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. What happens after a hate crime? It's a question we've been exploring in the wake of a staggering increase in the number of incidents reported to police in this country. What we've learned is that the vast majority of culprits get away with it, sparking calls for a change in the way hate is investigated. The Online Harms Act, otherwise known as Bill C-63, is really at least three bills in one. I tackled the internet platform portion of the bill last month in an episode with Vivek Krishnamurthy, and then last week, Professor Richard Moon joined to talk about the return of Section 13 of the Canada Human Rights Act. Part three may be the most controversial, the inclusion of criminal code changes that has left even supporters of the bill uncomfortable. Boris Batensky of the firm Batensky Schickman has been a leading Canadian criminal law lawyer for decades and currently serves as the president of the Criminal Lawyers Association. He joins me on the podcast to discuss the bill's criminal code reforms as he identifies some of the practical implications that have thus far been largely overlooked in the public debate. Boris, welcome to the podcast. I'm so thrilled to be here, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's really nice to have you. We're old friends. And so this is kind of worlds colliding here. It's kind of great. Uh, This is actually the third episode that I've done on Bill C-63, the Online Harms Act. I started about a month or so ago with uh, Vivek Krishnamurthy. We focus primarily on the internet platform rules. Just last week, Professor Richard Moon from Windsor, who joined to talk about the return of Section 13 of the Canada Human Rights Act. Uh, And I think in some ways I may have saved the most controversial for last, certainly judging by some of the media coverage that it's gotten. And that's the criminal code changes that I have to say, I think has even left supporters of the bill pretty uncomfortable. So there's several provisions that are there. And I was hoping that you could provide some of the much needed context and understanding. uh, I sometimes get asked about these provisions. I'm not a criminal lawyer. You are. And so uh, it's really great to have you on. Why don't we start first with the issue around sentencing? And there are two. The first is section 320.1001. Uh, but primarily, it's an offense motivated by hatred. Now, what does this provision seek to do? So this is probably the uh, most controversial, I think, aspect of the new uh, bill. And I think this is the one that's going to have the most attention focused on it. We we already have uh, provisions in our sentencing laws that re- uh, expressly require trial judges to take into account uh, any offense which sentence is being imposed if it's motivated by hate against any identifiable group. So that's already a law that we have. And then we have a a number of provisions that have maximum penalties. So what we've done now is we've created a new offense that seems to be very broad that will seek to criminalize as a separate offense any, uh, really any criminal conduct or any conduct that violates any act of parliament. So in theory, it could be an act against the Copyright Act or, or something similar. And if it is shown that it was motivated by hatred, then it is only prosecutable by indictment. At the, it's not a, 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 an offense that can be prosecuted by summary conviction. And for some of the criminal no, law nerds out there, I could explain the difference. But it basically uh, requires the matter to proceed under the more serious uh, procedural uh, manner, which is indictable offenses, and it provides for a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. So it drastically raises the sentence, and it provides a catch-all provision to create a new offense, basically, of doing anything that's motivated by hate. And that is a very broad power, uh, unlike the other provisions which already exist in our law, which are also seeing their maximum sentences raised, um, but really nothing else is being done to change those sections. The uh, Those primarily require the uh, approval of the Attorney General in every province to commence a prosecution. This new offense does not. So it is subject to be used and abused, and uh, it is it is a matter that a prosecutor could choose to uh, really hold something over an accused head in a case that may have very little to do about hate. So it's a very broad power, one that I'd be a little surprised if it actually made its way into the final legislation in its current form. But as currently drafted, it provides quite a bit of, I, I suspect, problems uh, but also a, a hammer that it gives to the prosecution if it chooses to use it. 
Okay. I have to admit that goes even further than, than much of the discussion. Much of the discussion is focused on this notion of life in prison, but it sounds like both there are already provisions that seemingly could deal with some of this, but even beyond that, that this really escalates from a prosecutorial perspective, how these, how, how this will be dealt with. Yeah. Let's, let's just back up for a second. The current laws provide a number of provisions regarding hate crimes that are already in our criminal law. And currently, they do not permit a maximum sentence of life in prison. So those offenses are, there, there's proposals within this legislation to raise the maximum sentence for each of those offenses to a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. Now, no one's going to get life imprisonment unless it's an extreme case for somebody that's got a very long record of committing these types of offenses. So it's not likely that anyone's going to get a life sentence, but there are two uh, very important aspects of raising a sentence in this way. People will say that this is virtue signaling, which it is, but it also is legal virtual signal, virtue signaling in the sense that it sends a clear message from parliament to our judges that they are obliged to increase sentences for this area. So it's not just a message to the public that we're going to raise the maximum sentence. It's actually a message done in, a, in, a, in the only way that parliament can, uh, short of imposing minimum sentences. It's the only way that, a go that the government can send a message to judges to raise sentences. And we've seen this in sexual offense legislation. So when we raise the maximum sentences, courts have interpreted those provisions as an indication by parliament that judges are supposed to impose heavier sentences for conduct that used to attract something lighter. So this is exactly the same thing we see happening in this area. And frankly, it makes sense. There is criticism that our existing law don't provide for, for sentences that have been uh, particularly strict. So this gives that extra push to judges. It's a message sent to judges and to the public, which frankly, I'm not particularly concerned about. Um, in addition to raising the sentences of our existing offenses, it's created this new section, which carries a maximum sentence of life. And this new offense is very broad. It applies not just to criminal conduct. It applies to anything which is motivated by hate. And the problem is it doesn't say solely motivated by hate. The words that are used in the bill is just simply motivated by hate. And what does that mean? I don't know. And I'm not sure anybody really knows. Does it mean partially motivated by hate? A little bit. Mostly motivated by hate, solely motivated by hate. If there's a bar brawl uh, that is nothing more than a common assault and somebody yells a racial or a homophobic slur in the middle of it, uh, does that convert a previous assault into now a hate crime that is prosecutable only by indictment with a maximum life sentence? There's a lot of unanswered questions here. In our current legislation, we already have the provision that judges can use hate as an aggravated factor on sentencing. So if it's present as any kind of factor, judges can use that to impose a higher sentence. Do we need a new provision when we already have that? I'm not so sure. But that's what uh, Parliament has chosen to do through this draft legislation. One other aspect I'll just mention very briefly, because I think it goes unnoticed. Uh, when you create a maximum life sentence, you actually remove a sentencing option for low-level offenses. So when somebody's convicted of a crime, the lowest sentence they can uh, receive after being found guilty is what we call a discharge. So it could be an absolute discharge or a conditional discharge. But the impact of that is you don't have a conviction registered against you. And there are many examples about how a conviction can interfere with your life. Let's say in an immigration context, if you want to sponsor somebody, um, many jobs have a uh, some restrictions if you have a conviction. But if you're discharged, you avoid any of those consequences because it's meant to signal that it's a low-level offense and you are usually a first offender. So there are ways that you can get to a discharge. Uh, our criminal law expressly forbids the granting of a discharge to anybody who's convicted of an offense that carries a maximum sentence of life. So by raising the sentence, you've actually removed discharges as a sentencing option for low-level offenders that might otherwise qualify uh, for a discharge in their circumstances. That that is also uh, perhaps something that the government hasn't thought about in drafting it, or maybe they have, I don't know. But the, but the bottom line is that is an impact of it that m very few people I think have, have talked about. Yeah, no, I haven't seen any discussion of that. I'm, I'm glad, glad you raise it. You mentioned some of the challenges from a definitional perspective, but you just don't know exactly how this would be interpreted. Some people have, have raised the question, well, what is hate? even mean. And, and there is a definition for hatred, speaking to emotion that involves detestation or vilification that's stronger than disdain or dislike. Can you explain where, where that comes from and, and some of your thoughts on the line between legal and illegal speech? 
So that that's not new. Um, that's that goes back to the Keekstra decision in the Supreme Court of Canada, which is uh, frankly been around for for decades. So there's no um, what what it has done is it's codified the language that was previously judge made. Uh, I think there's always going to be attention about what conduct does or doesn't cross the line, and by simply putting this into the, the statute, I'm not sure you're going to change much of the current debate or uncertainty. Uh, that said, it is a good thing because, frankly, by creating a, a definition that that is from Parliament as opposed from a judge, leaves aside the possibility that judges will change it in the future. So, uh, where it's based on the common law, and I'm not sure the Supreme Court's rushing to to rewrite their definition of hate, but nevertheless, it creates the definition from the the source of our legislators, which is probably a good thing. And it creates some certainty to the public about what hate at least is intended to mean. So I, I think it, in that sense, there's nothing wrong with it, but I don't think it really, uh, it's not new. And I don't think it's going to change any of the uncertainty about what conduct does or doesn't cross the line. But you're quite right. The intention is to capture only conduct that is well over the line. It's not meant to things uh, to, ca to capture things that merely offend or make people annoyed or inconvenienced. Um, and, and frankly, that's as it should be, because one of the other things the Supreme Court of Canada recognized many years ago is that limiting speech is a, a violation of your constitutional rights and freedoms. Uh, we don't generally want to limit people's right to freedom of expression, and we do so only when it's necessary. And that line is drawn when, when the conduct crosses into true hate speech, when it's truly uh, well beyond the line and that's how parliament clearly writes it in this bill yeah now you you highlighted as as you went through the inclusion of this provision a, a number of the the consequences and, and there's some pretty significant ones one of some of the responses we've seen coming from supporters of this part of the bill particular from the, the government from the pmo from the justice minister is to say listen you know we recognize people might be concerned with this plain language it says life in prison potentially uh, associated with these crimes where there's this motivation of hatred. But they say, listen, what we really were trying to do was to match this provision with the underlying offense. And, and don't worry, there are sentencing guidelines, there are reasonableness requirements, there are appellate courts, all these kinds of things are, are there as safeguards to ensure that this isn't uh, misused or abused. You know, how would you respond to their response? Well, I... I think that the the main problem is that we're under resourced in terms of our ability to prosecute these offenses. If you want to create laws that are going to do nothing but signal to the public that you take that seriously, I don't want to say the value of that is zero, but the value of that is fairly minimal. So yes, it is important, especially in these geopolitical times. We do have raise a significant raise in hate crimes. Um, it is there is value of having the government stand up and say. You stop this. We shouldn't be doing any of this. We need to rein it in. Uh, so there's that, that that virtue signaling message, which has minimal value. If you want to get it to stop, this law is not going to do it because what we need to do is, is use the tools we already have. Most of the tools that are necessary to fight hate speech in the criminal context, is are, are, those tools are already there. Um, so we need to invest more in prosecutions. We need to invest more in, in training prosecutors to be able to know and apply this law. We need to spend more money, frankly, on police resources to be able to prosecute these offenses because most police departments don't have enough um, by way of, uh, of a number of officers who are either trained or assigned to these units to handle the, the rising in de demand for, for the, this work. So if you want to stop things, we need to actually spend more time prosecuting these things. So none of that's going to change, in my view, just changing the law is not going to change conduct. In terms of the government's position that you raised, and I'm sorry, I didn't directly answer your question initially, but the response to, to their saying, well, we're going to trust prosecutors to apply reasonableness, that's true of a lot of things. And frankly, my you know my experience is that your mileage may vary. It really depends on region. It depends on the the attitude of the office. And history tells us that we're not very good at treating all groups equally. So uh, we're not very good about how we treat crimes against certain identifiable groups. We are, uh, and that falls and rises with political times as well. This isn't only about one group. Uh, this is about trying to protect all groups that are the subject of potential hate. And I'm not sure historically we've done a very good job of it. We've tend to to overdo things on one end and underdo things on another. So I, I do worry about just leaving into the discretion. 
um, of others. And, and I particularly worry about this new provision, Section 320.1001, which is the one section in this whole uh, scheme that doesn't require the consent of the attorney general to commence a prosecution, because that is the one that is most open to prosecutorial abuse. And I, I just want to add this. In my experience, and I've been practicing criminal law for almost 30 years, uh, been a lawyer for more than that, but exclusively in criminal law uh, for almost that amount of time, is that um, the problem isn't in the, in the ultimate trial of a case. The problem is that it creates an imbalance of bargaining position. And when a prosecutor holds certain cards um, that are potentially too powerful, it results in matters that can't resolve through ordinary pretrial discussion. It results uh, in an inability to actually do things sometimes that everybody wants to do because of political and legislative barriers to what otherwise might seem to be reasonable conduct. So when you're actually saying, well, people are going to act reasonably by creating some of the provisions that you create, you're actually creating an environment where it makes it very difficult for people to act reasonably. So do you think the provision is is fixable? I mean, that, that'll be the question that MPs ask when it gets to committee. There'll be those that'll say, just take it out altogether. But their 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 natural response will be, well, how can we amend it to to address some of the kinds of concerns you've raised? So it's interesting because the one thing that, uh, again, I don't think has been talked about, but as part of this draft legislation, they've removed a section that currently exists. Uh, we currently have a, a, a one section in the mischief provision. Mischief is when you willfully damage something. Uh, so we currently have a provision uh, th that's in the criminal code that is a mischief to places of worship. So section 430, uh, sub 4.1 of the criminal code, there's a related provision which creates a, a, an enhanced form of mischief if you do it against a uh, a place that's either a school or a social uh, location, a senior's home or a cemetery or some other uh, place that's marked through a religious designation of some sort, or otherwise that is tied to an identifiable group. So I suppose it doesn't have to be necessarily based on religion. That, those provisions are being repealed. And it may be a guess that this new 320 provision is kind of meant to replace it because it's going to be a catch-all. It's a little bit broader than just mischief. It's going to capture other activities. And I think that the intention was to slightly broaden the old mischief law and to say, well, listen, whenever you're dealing with with that that's hate hate motivated crime, we want to create some kind of legislative provision that makes us makes it clear that we don't agree with this more than just a sentencing provision that if it's a factor in the whatever crime you commit we're just going to actually treat it as a separate offense but i think they've gone too far by by, by going and I, and I suspect that some of the discussion in committee is going to be about well can we can we bring this back a little bit or can we at least if it's going to be something that's prosecuted by uh, life imprisonment can we at least insist on having ag consent if you want to throw this massive power uh, into the prosecution. So I suspect that's going to be a conversation about dialing it back, maybe providing for the requirement of AG consent that will help actually some of the problem that, I, that I've identified. Because then you're capturing conduct that we want to capture and it creates and it requires or leaves the safeguard of the consent of the attorney general to ensure that it's only exercised in a truly serious case. And if it's just a factor in the crime and if it's just an ordinary crime, then it can be a factor on sentencing, really, which is where that factor belongs. And you don't need AG consent to invoke the sentencing powers. So if you do commit a driving offense or, a, you know, the barroom brawl where you happen to have some aspect of hate motivation, that can and should be considered as an aggravating factor on your sentencing if you're found guilty, but it doesn't create a separate regime about how you proceed and you know, ensuring that you have a jury trial and all sorts of other things that um, really aren't necessary, I think, to accomplish what is sought to be accomplished. That's an interesting potential way of trying to adjust the provision. There, There is a, a second provision, you, you, I think you can sort of alluded to it slightly, around genocide. Uh, speaking of every person who advocates or promotes genocide being guilty of indictable offense and liable to pris imprisonment for life. You know, is this new? I, I would have thought we'd have something on genocide. So, you know, what is this changing? It's not new. Uh, the only thing that's changing is the is the maximum sentence is going up to a life sentence again to be consistent with the other offenses. Uh, this is a section of the code that is rarely prosecuted. And uh, for good reason, frankly, because I like to think this conduct doesn't occur very often, uh, but it is something that um, is continued into the new legislation or the draft legislation. And it's not, um, it, as I see it, I don't see any real changes other than the, the penalty provisions changed. 
the other major source of controversy associated with the criminal code provisions has to do with peace bonds. Uh, and so there is a provision in there, fear of hate propaganda offense or hate crime at section 810.012. Can you get us started by explaining what a peace bond is, how common are they, and what precautions or safeguards exist for them? So I actually, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll answer those questions in a second, but I, but I want to say at the outset, I think that these are the best legislative uh, proposals, at least insofar as the, are the criminal uh, side of things in this bill. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on all the other aspects of it that deal with non-criminal matters. But on the criminal side, I think this is the best part of the proposal uh, because what it actually allows us to do is to um, address through the criminal law uh, some uh, ability to stop either low-level conduct or, frankly, to stop conduct before it, it starts. I mean, one of the problems with criminal law in general is that it tends to be reactive as opposed to proactive. It tends to respond to crime and may see messages to the, I mean, at least it's designed to send messages to the next person who's thinking of this conduct, you know, about not doing it, but really doesn't do anything to prevent people from pre, pre, from uh, committing crime. And the peace bond provisions do. So section 810 of the criminal code in general has been around for a long time. Uh, it allows a court to impose basically a restriction on an individual where there is a reasonable fear to be fearful of something. And there's a lot of somethings because there are a lot of these provisions that now exist. So the original one is if you are if you fear that you're gonna cause uh, harm to any person uh, or commit property damage, you can bring an application to the court and the court can convene a hearing. And if the court finds that your reasonable basis for the fear is made out and it's on a balance of probabilities, not beyond a reasonable doubt, they can force somebody to enter into a, what we call a recognizance, which is like a, almost like a bail order and to behave yourself and to abide by a set of conditions for a period of time, usually for 12 months. And if you don't, then you're subject to either being charged with break, uh, violating the terms of the recognizance, which is a separate crime, or you could be imprisoned and there's different potential consequences depending on what you do. So we've expanded that over the years to include fear of sexual offending. So you have somebody that is a sexual, serial sexual offender. They're about to be released from prison. We have a few examples of this in our in our legal history where before just before that person is about to be released because there's real concerns that they're going to reoffend. The government brings an application. The prosecution uh, brings that person before the court to have them enter into a series of uh, conditions, excuse me, in a recognizance that will bind their conduct. So they'll, in a sexual offender situation, they'll be prohibited from going near daycares or playgrounds or other places where children may congregate, will protect the community from a person that is seen to be a significant danger. So those provisions have been around, they've been found to be constitutional. So now what we've done uh, through this bill is we've created a new type of peace bond, which will allow uh, a judge to impose when, when there's a, a demonstrated reasonable fear that a person may engage in this type of conduct that will uh, incite or promote uh, hatred towards a community, that um, a judge can force somebody to enter into a peace bond or into a recognizance, which will have a certain set of conditions. It's a form of an injunction in the criminal law uh, with some potential penal consequences if they're violated. So the benefits of this are that you don't need to show proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Typically, the criminal law uh, requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt of any offenses. This does not require that. Um, it is proactive in the sense that if you have a reasonable basis to fear, and it's usually somebody that's done this thing before or has somehow announced to perhaps a group of followers on social media that this is what they plan to do as opposed to having actually done it. So it allows for proactive steps to be taken to restrict that uh, individual in some way to protect the community from this type of conduct. Now, having said that, the bad part of it is that it still requires AG consent, which is maybe a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, it, it's a good thing because it'll limit it to the, the serious uh, situations, but it's a bad thing because I think the the the, the nice thing about these provisions is it it will fill a gap where something may not rise to the level of seriousness that requires criminal prosecution, but it may require speedier action by uh, members of the police force. So if somebody posts messages online, uh, these steps can be taken to prevent that individual from engaging in something by the police if the power existed without a attorney general consent. But if you first have to get the attorney general to sign off on it, that may as a practical matter, just simply provide you with uh, real 
obstacles that can't be overcome in a timely way if if it's something that does arise perhaps from online conversation or something else which may require a speedier response so it's meant to be um an instrument of uh of protection it can be used that way it doesn't have the same stigmatization stigmatizing consequences that a criminal conviction does it's a lower burden of proof so these are all potentially good things and in this day and age frankly we have a lot of we have a lot of bad stuff happening around uh, our country whether it's on campuses whether it's in our communities uh geopolitically we're we're not stable right now and because of uh some of the conduct that that we hear and read about on a regular basis that arguably crosses these lines it would be a useful tool for our authorities to have to stop this conduct without actually getting into the blunt instrument that criminal law is. So it, 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 it's got a lot of potential. I suspect it could be some tweaks, but it's actually the one aspect of this legislation from a criminal law side, I think that it should be commended. All right. It's interesting to, to hear you come out in support of it. It does raise at least a couple of questions. I guess first is you know, that oversight piece, which might be a feature or a bug. Uh, I, I guess I'm curious what, what, what safeguards are there? Is that is that the primary one? Is it that because you've got to obtain this extra layer of approval, that that's essentially what prevents misuse of this kind of provision? Because I could certainly see someone saying the same kind of concerns that you articulated earlier about potential misuse. If without that sort of oversight, perhaps the same kind of thing occurs here as well. So let me just clarify uh, your comment from a second ago, Michael. I, I don't think I'm in support of this. I'm in support of this within the context of choosing to go into this area. So uh, frankly, I think that um, we don't need any of this legislation because we have the tools that are already available to us. Having said that, so again, you know, if the two binary options are not to go here at all or to go here and we must, then uh, within that binary decision, my view is that this is the best aspect of what we've chosen to do. Having said that, among the options, this is fine, and I agree with you, it is subject to the same abuse, but the difference being that somebody who is subject to whatever potential problems through abuse under the peace bond provisions is only going to be bound by restrictions and not imprisoned and not prosecuted and doesn't have the direct criminal consequences uh, of the abuse of power that can exist and actually be a direct prosecution which carries criminal sanction in, in a much more severe way. Okay. the 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 other response that that I that I've seen around this provision is to say, yeah, well, we know, of course, that, that these have been used in for fear of someone who's about to assault someone or something like that. But this this involves speech, or in many instances, might involve speech. Uh, do you think that makes a difference here? Are the do we have a history of using this kind of provision in a speech context? Uh, I can't think of anything analogous that is speech based. So. Um, I, I agree that it's a distinction, but I'm not sure it's a distinction with a difference, because if we go back to sort of our constitutional principles regarding free speech, um, we say that you have the right to free speech until it crosses the line into harm, into significant harm. So if you go down that road and, cho and choose to cross that line, then, then the constitutional protections of free speech won't protect you from criminal prosecution. So... I suspect the same kind of arguments apply here. If we have a reasonable fear that you are about to engage in conduct that would cross that line, then we can use a, a lesser criminal law power to place some restrictions on your conduct without finding that you've actually committed uh, any particular crime already, without imposing a sentence and giving you a criminal conviction. Uh, we can choose to take some lesser steps, but frankly, I imagine the court would have to apply the same test. So the fear has to be of you uh, crossing that line, if you will, that goes beyond your rights to free speech. And if there is a if if that test is met, then you don't have the constitutional protection to that conduct, anyways. So I mean, I suppose that what we've done here is we've moved it one level closer. You actually haven't done it yet. We are fearful of what you might do. Uh, it, assuming it's a reasonable fear, and and we're basically saying you can't do this. But again, if what we're saying that you can't do is itself over the constitutional line, then I'm not so sure that I necessarily have a, a big problem with it. So unless you're an individual who who thinks and, and and argues that we can't restrict speech in any way under any circumstances, and I don't share that view, but if if that is your viewpoint, then you will find these provisions offensive. 
but otherwise, if you accept that we can impose a reasonable limit on your speech to begin with, then I think this this provision is consistent with whatever we've already decided on this front. So I'm not sure that it changes much. Why don't we conclude with this? You, you mentioned you've been practicing criminal law now for decades, and I think everyone recognizes we've seen an increase in the amount of hate, particularly online, but it's certainly also been on our streets and, as you noted, on our campuses. You know, are penalties the problem? Is this legislation the solution? Um, and if it is or isn't, what other changes uh, would you have in mind to try to address some of these societal concerns? So penalties are clearly not the problem. Uh, we know from years of social science uh, that penalties have very, very little impact on crime. So um, I don't see any reason why it would be different in this context. It's It's been true in just about every context that's ever been studied in. Raising penalties doesn't reduce drinking and driving. It doesn't reduce violence. It doesn't reduce this. It doesn't reduce that when it comes to criminal law. And I have no reason to expect that it will change anything here. In fact, one can even argue that since some of this stuff uh, is so intentional, um, creating a forum for this to get into the public domain through a court case actually might, in, in a very perverse way, incentivize people. Uh, to commit more crimes. So I don't think raising penalties uh, has ever worked and it's not going to work here. If you want to cut down um, what's happening on our streets and our campuses, uh, the the solutions always through better or more enforcement. Uh, you put more um, of an emphasis on prosecution, on, on, um, on arrest, on intervention, even if it stops short of actually prosecuting somebody, just merely having the police contact to say, you know, a warning of sorts. Um, any uh, any time that it's been studied, the increase in enforcement, even not, not necessarily with prosecution, but simply just involvement of of, of resources to enforce, has always had an, a positive correlative effect with reducing crime. So you want to reduce the stuff, spend the resources in uh, taking steps to enforce the laws that we have. Um, that would be, I think, money much better spent. Okay. All right. Boris, I mean, it's been a terrific uh, explanation of the provisions, their implications with sort of that, that real world, uh, how it actually would operate on the ground or in the courthouse kind of thing. So, so thank you so much for taking the time to unpack the implications of the criminal code provisions in Bill C-63. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for having me on. It was a pleasure. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to lawbites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at lawbitespod or Michael Geist at mgeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time.